Okay, so welcome to the Spotlight Conversation on Suture Time with Natalie Gummer. I'm Karen Myers, and I'm Academic Director of Mungalum Research Center, which is located in Berkeley, California, on the territory of Huichin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people who are still alive and flourishing in the Bay Area. And I'm going to have um, my co host, uh, Tillich, drop a little link in um, the chat saying more about that. Um, before I introduce Natalie and turn things over to her, um, I'd like to introduce my co-host who I just mentioned, Tillich. I don't know if you can wave your hand, Tillich, so people can see, <laughs> see you. So, um, he, okay, great. Um, so um, he'll be um, popping links into the chat. So that's who I'm referring to when I, Say to look, and he can also help you if you're having any technical difficulties. Um, and so also before we get started, I'd like to say a few um, words about upcoming Mangalam programs. And so this evening's talk is part of the spotlight series of conversations with scholars of Buddhist studies. And these conversations are really aimed at a general audience, although specialists are also welcome to come and often do. Um, usually there's a 30 to 40 minute presentation um, by the guest, and then there is um, Q&A and discussion with the audience. So if you go to the Mangalam website, you can see um, past and upcoming conversations in the series. And so the theme for this year's Spotlight series is the imagination in Buddhist thought, practice, and art. So keep tuned if that um, topic interests you. The next conversation, which might not be up yet on the website, I didn't check today, um, but that will be with Martin Adam from the University of Victoria in British Columbia. And he will be talking about his Buddhist rock opera or pop musical comedy about the trials and tribulations of Western monks discovering Buddhism in Thailand. And that'll be two weeks from now on December 16th. And you can register for it now um, on Eventbrite. And so Tillich will put that into the chat. And um, the Eventbrite description has a little link to um, the album so you can, and info about the musical, so you can listen to some of the tracks if you're interested. Um, and then we're going to have a break for January, and then in the beginning of February, February 3rd, Andy Rotman will be coming and talking about his new book on Hungry Ghosts, and so Tillich will also put a little link to that book in the chat, and that, I don't have the registration up for that yet, um, but you'll get info about upcoming talks if you're, if you're here this evening or watching um, and registered. Um, so Buddhism and the imagination is also a theme for an upcoming course that I will be teaching um, online at Mangalam starting January 19th. And you can find details for that course on our website and also through the link, which <laughs> Tillich will also put in the chat. Um, and there's an early bird discount on that course that's good through the 15th. And um, that's E bird 21 all caps and to like we'll also pop that in the chat and we also have scholarships available so so if it's still too steep with that discount just write me um at mongolumresearch.org and to like we'll put that my email in the chat and um we i'll give you the information about scholarships um, if you're a teacher or a librarian in higher education in the U.S. or an ABD grad student at a U.S. institution, um, or I think also if you're abroad but are from the U.S., you um, can might be interested in applying for the National Endowment for Humanities Summer Institute that we will be hosting in person um, in at Mangalam. Um, this June, June 12th through 24th, you know, we'll see what happens with Omicron and whatever else the pandemic has first, but hopefully that'll be in person. Um, and if not, we will definitely have it 
virtually. <laughs> um, and so Tillich can also give you information for that in the chat. And finally, as you may have seen in the announcement for this talk, there's a super secret special discount on um, language of the, um, on the Mangalam Press volume edited by uh, Natalie, Language of the Sutras Essays in honor of Luis Gomez, um, who is our dearly departed um, colleague and former, direct, um, former academic director of Mangalam Research Center. And so you can look at the book information in the link that Tillich will put in the chat and the code um, Tillich will also, the discount code he'll put in the chat and that's for 20% off. And the code, if you're listening later, <laughs> and it's good through the end of the year, is LOS, all capitals, and then dash 2021, no spaces. So all caps LOS dash 2021, and that's 20% off. Um, so that's all the announcements for this evening. I'm very pleased that Natalie Gummer accepted the invitation to come to speak this evening. Like many of you here, I'm a huge fan of her work and a particularly huge fan of the essay, which she'll be, um, the talk is based this evening. Um, and um, this essay and the others in the um, language of the sutras volume, um, which again was edited by Natalie, um, were originally presented. So, so her essay and, and others in the volume were originally presented at a conference that was held here at Mangalam Research Center in 2015. And I think um, many of you probably know a bit about Natalie, but for those of you who don't, she received her PhD in Buddhist studies from Harvard University, where she studied with Charlie Hallisey, who also wrote, wrote a foreword for the book in memory of Louise and his work. Um, Natalie is professor of religious studies at Beloit College in Wisconsin, and her research examines textual practices in pre-modern Mahayana Buddhist literary cultures, as well as the, their potential value in contemporary ethical and philosophical debates. In addition to editing the language of the sutras, she is currently completing a book on performativity and embodiment in Mahayana sutras. And it sounds like that's in, well, it'll be out soonish, <laughs> maybe next year, <laughs> maybe soon after that. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to extend my heartfelt welcome to Natalie and turn things over to her. Okay. Well, let me just get my PowerPoint set up here. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, Karin. Um, it's a real privilege to be here with all of you. And thanks so much to everyone who's taking time out of their afternoon or evening um, to be here. Um, so this project uh, grew out of my aspiration as a scholar of Buddhist literature to rethink scholarly theories and methods in dialogue with Buddhist communities, practices, and ideas, past and present, rather than assuming and imposing modern Western liberal secular notions as though they were universal. So um, in particular, I, I find that normative assumptions about language and literature in the modern secular study of religion are often inadequate or impoverished or misleading if we want to come to a deeper understanding of what literature, Buddhist literature, and perhaps beyond is doing, right? Not just saying, but doing. So I'm aiming to develop methods for interpreting Buddhist texts, especially Mahayana sutras, that think alongside Buddhist claims about the power of language to create and transform the world and oneself. That power lies behind Buddhist conceptions of language as perpetuating delusion, but it also lies behind the complex creative uses of language in Buddhist sutras and poetry, and behind the incredible variety of Buddhist practices that involve language. So we scholars should attempt to understand it more deeply, I think. 
Um, one of the main ways that scholars, including myself, approach Mahayana Sutras is as products of a particular historical and cultural context. And that's undoubtedly a valuable way to study them from which we have learned a great deal. Yeah? But I often feel a tension between modern Western notions of history, which are supposedly valid for all times and places, right? And the very different and extremely sophisticated conceptions and uses of time in the sutras themselves. When we take a secular modern um, view of historical time and, and, and understand it to be universally valid, Buddhist ideas and practices involving time are reduced to cultural or religious relics, right? As though they were fictional stories or doctrinal truth claims that are obviously false from a modern secular perspective. Um, but dichotomies like history and fiction reality and imagination, secular and religious, all of these are modern dichotomies that don't map so easily onto the Mahayana literature of ancient South Asia. Um, so when we treat them as our foundation for analyzing Buddhist literature, we make Buddhist literature into something that it's not. I wanna find a different way to approach this. So um, as Nietzsche notes in this passage, the meaning and value of studying the past is surely its potential for challenging and transforming the assumptions of the present and the future. But Nietzsche's challenge can be taken as a challenge to history writing itself. I mean, if our time is a time defined by the subjection of all time to the putatively universal and homogeneous framework of secular history, we might ask how our study of Buddhist sutras can act counter to that time and how it might be of benefit for a, for a time to come. So in this presentation and in the essay on which it's based, I aim to shed light on what some Mahayana sutras are doing with time and to explore how they might shed some light on modern historical conceptions and practices. I mean, to be clear, um, Historical conceptions of time are incredibly valuable and important. The ideal of reconstructing the past based on present evidence is crucial to our ability to contest totalizing narratives, right? Narratives that se seek to make the past into one story and erase other versions of events. So I'm not trying to call that into question. Um, the idea though, that modern notions of time are the only ones that are real and that all other so-called cultural notions of time ought to be subordinated to historical time is itself a totalizing narrative, yeah? So what might we have to learn from Buddha's, Buddhist ideas and practices involving time? I mean, what resources might they offer us for approaching our own world differently? Um, to address these questions, I want to explore with you today what the sutras have to teach us, not so much about the historical time in which they were composed and used, as about their narrative and performative strategies for transforming and transcending time and place. Um, with those strategies in mind, um, I will return to think about historiographical vantage points and practices and to the possibilities presented by our engagement with the sutras for reconceiving and thus altering the task of the historian. Um, so in exploring the construction of time in the sutras and its potential to enrich the writing of history, I do not mean to suggest that these texts or their authors lack historical consciousness as has way too often been inserted about various forms of South Asian discourse, Buddhist and otherwise, right? Very far from it, actually. Um, Mahayana sutras are woven with the language of time, right? They're shot through with a profound understanding of human finitude and lifespan and knowledge. Um, but our boundedness in space and time, what we might call our historicity, is precisely the condition from which the sutras seek to release us, right? And they do so in no small part through the narrative manipulation of time. So um, before I turn to the sutras themselves, let me provide a framework for some comparative reflection on different conceptions and manipulations of time um, through the work of conceptual historian Reinhard Koselleck. Um, so Koselleck argues that the condition of being human is characterized in terms of time by the relationship of the space of experience and the horizon of expectation. Um, these are complex concepts and not defined in opposition to an each other, but just in simple terms, the space of experience 
is present past, past events, right? Both in your life and in the traditions and narratives that you inherit through family and community and education and so forth. Um, they are remembered and incorporated in the present, right? Your past experience, both direct and inherited, is made present in multiple and embodied aspects of who you are and how you act. Um, conversely, the horizon of expectation is the future made present, right? The hopes and fears, prognoses and doubts about the future that shape the now. Right? I think we're all only too painfully aware of what this means in our current circumstances, yeah. Um, so um, Koselleck argues that the concept of history in general that constitutes the temporal backdrop of contemporary history writing emerges in tandem with modernity and the notion of progress. Um, so modernity entails a break from the past and, and, the, and, and also an orientation toward the future, right? So um, the space of experience, that's the presence and relevance of the past in our lives, right? That contracts and the past is reduced to that against which progress is measured and celebrated and expectations are unmoored from experience. This is what he says. Um, the modern historical project, Koselleck argues, emerges from this privileging of the trajectory toward the future, which makes the past something completely behind us, right? Um, so the kind of narrative of progress marches forward, right? And our vicarious experience of the past through historical narrative, far from providing a basis for formulating expectations for the future, furnishes instead a kind of negative instance that's needed to confirm progress, right? The superiority of now to then, of us to our pre-modern predecessors, yeah? Um, aside from providing this crucial negation on the back of which the whole narrative of progress rests, the study of the past is, in, is rendered increasingly inconsequential. I mean, what could it hold for a future of which we can say only that it will be different and better than the past, right? Um, so the notion of progress entails not only a trajectory toward a better future, but also the singularity of all of history as a part of that trajectory, right? The past offers no guidance for a future without precedent. Um, history does not repeat itself if it just keeps getting better, right? if things just keep getting better. Um, now, I mean, in what, what we call late modernity, where we are supposedly now, right? The notion of progress seems increasingly suspect to us, I think, in lots of ways, right? And yet it continues to shape our experiences and expectations. Um, but if Koselleck is right to assume that the space of experience and the horizon of expectation are relatively stable aspects of neurotypical human life, right? Um, and I think he probably is, right? Then, then they might prove really use, as useful tools, um, not only for a deeper understanding of modern conceptions of history, um, but also for eliciting from the sutras, a theory and method for the narrative transformation of time that they're engaged in, right? Um, so although the time envisioned and created by the sutras is quite different from these modern notions, the temporal situation that the stories assume and address is one that we ourselves know very well, right? We don't know why we have been born into a particular place, family, body, community, why misfortune or fortune comes to us or what will happen to us next, right? The Buddhist notion that our previous actions in a beginningless cycle of rebirth have brought us to our current past, that provides an explanatory framework, but it's one without known content, right? Only compounding the uncertainties that attend our experience in time and of time. So um, the sutras step into this gap. They're characterized by an almost constant movement between past and future indexed to the moment of narration, right? A moment that simultaneously defines the present and lays claim to eternality, reframing the life of the listener and their relationship to their own past, present and future as a result. So um, contemporary conceptions of religion tend to paint this kind of reframing as a matter of belief. Yeah? 
That is, you know, that such transformations would depend on the listener taking the extraordinary events narrated in the sutras as material realities that the text just describes, right? Um, in this kind of a view, um, Mahayana sutras seem to me more than a little confusing, right? Because you've got Buddhas whizzing through the air, gigantic jeweled stupas, reliquaries, right? Floating up into space from the ground. I mean, you know, taking these things as sort of like literal descriptions of what happened. Um, yeah, a bit confusing for me at least. I don't, I, I don't really think that that's what's going on with them, right? Um, I don't think the sutras describe a world so much as seek to create one in the mind of listeners, right? Um, and um, David Schulman's book, More Than Real, demonstrates this with reference to a considerable range of South Asian literature. As he says, it's imagination much more than everyday objects that is dependently linked to the real. I mean, I think this is like a hard point for us to even um, conceptualize because our the the um, at least the secular culture that many of us are surrounded with in one way or another is so focused on the material as the real right thinking about what it would be to really um, uh, grapple deeply with the imagination as the the locus of reality right and I think the sutras are really doing something with this idea um, so really important point, I think. Oh, sorry, there's our quote. Um, so um, in the Mahayana Sutra is under consideration here, as in much of the broader South Asian context, language is the means for imagining the world and one's life differently, right? The imaginative worlds constructed in these sutras are profoundly visual and spatial, but in important ways, the mechanism for bringing those worlds into being, and especially for dramatically manifesting the sutra's transformative relationship to the listener is the linguistic manipulation of time. Um, so in the remainder of my time with you, let me examine just one of the temporal strategies employed in the, the Siddharma Pundarika, the Lotus Sutra. Um, and what I wanna look at is the intertwining of predictions and postdictions. Um, I'll talk about what I mean by that in just a second, right? In the essay um, on which this presentation is based, I examined two additional strategies, but just don't have time for that today. So um, uh, let's see, prediction. Um, prediction are speech acts that make the future, right? Including predictions to Buddhahood, um, Yakarana for the Sanskritists. Um, uh, and then post-diction are speech acts that make the past, um, including numerous stories of past lives, right? Um, and these two strategies, one that unearths the unimaginably distant past, the other revealing an unimaginably distant future, frequently operate in tandem with one another to transform the relationship between the audience's horizon of expectation and space of experience, and thereby to transform the present moment of hearing or reading the sutra, right? So the narrative of the sutra includes a significant number of stories of the past and predictions of the future. They're usually told by the Buddha, whose omniscience gives him unfettered power to proclaim the past and future lives of all beings, right? He's the central figure who speaks in the sutra, but he also tells stories of previous narrations of the sutra by previous Buddhas and performers, right? Um, in fact, the, the entire sutra is framed by a story about numerous past performances of the sutra, and it predicts that those who performed the sutra in the past will attain Buddhahood because they performed it. So post-diction and pre-diction, totally intertwined, right, in these, in these stories. Um, and these stories of past performances thus imply both the eternality of the sutras in which they are contained, they've just been preached for time immemorial, right, by Buddhas after Buddhas after Buddhas, um, but they do something more, as, or sorry, um, they also uh, uh, proclaim their role as producers of, rather than products of Buddhas, right, the sutras make Buddhas, yeah. Um, but they do something more too. Um, on the one hand, they fold in on themselves since uh, the previous performances presumably contained precisely these same stories, right? Of previous performances. Um, sorry. 
Uh, on the other hand, the present moment at which the story of the past is heard by an audience becomes pregnant with the prediction of the future. Um, since the listener is undergoing exactly the same experience as those in the story who attained awakening as a result, right? So hearing the sutra makes the Buddha present through his speech and allows his speech to act on a whole new audience again, right? In this way, the experience of listening reconfigures the horizon of expectation for the listener. Um, so um, we might usefully distinguish the time of narration and the time of performance, right? The figures who speak inside the sutra um, at the time of its narration constantly reference times at which the sutra was performed in the past or will be performed in the future. Um, these pre predicted future moments, right, will become present when you hear a performer utter the sutra, right? There it is, the moment has arrived, yeah? Um, so when you hear the sutra, as you're about to do, I'll read some little parts of it anyway, right? Um, your moment of hearing it performed is transformed through its connection to past performances and the prediction in the sutra of precisely this moment of performance, right? Paradoxically then, the effect of these stories of the past and predictions for the future is the transformation of the present moment in which the reader or listener encounters them, right? The sutras are actively exploiting these really complex temporal dynamics all the time. So um, we're gonna take an example here, the manifestation of a stupa chapter of the Lotus Sutra. Um, you know, stupa is a reliquary, right? Um, the ambiguity of the stupa as a marker of both the absence and the presence of the Buddha is fully at play in this chapter. Um, it directly follows uh, the performer of the Dharma chapter in which the Buddha declares that a stupa is to be erected wherever the Lotus Sutra may be uttered or taught or written or recited from a manuscript or chanted. But the Buddha says, it is not necessary to deposit the relics of the Buddha there because the whole body of the Buddha is already, already interred there, right? So this passage obviously equates the spoken or written sutra with the interred body of the Buddha, right? Um, now, just in case we might assume that this makes the sutra a dead relic, however, the sub subsequent chapter, the manifestation of the sutra of, of the stupa chapter shows us just such a whole Buddha body, right? And it's described in exactly the same terms. And in, in, it's in an enormous, like several miles high, if you do the calculations, right? Jeweled stupa. And despite having entered final nirvana, that is, you know, died um, incalculable eons ago, the Buddha inside seems very much alive. Um, we first meet this stupa when it emerges from the earth and a great voice booms out of it, offering praise to the Buddha for teaching the Lotus Sutra. Um, the Buddha's interlocutor in this, in this chapter, um, who has the appropriate top, appropriately topical name, Great Eloquence, um, wonders what's happening. And the Buddha Shakyamuni reveals that the Buddha in the stupa, Prabhutaratna, um, his name means abundant jewels, um, which resembles his giant gem encrusted um, stupa, right? Um, he made a vow in a past life to appear whenever the Lotus Sutra is performed. Okay. Um, and indeed, listeners or readers of the sutra do see his body, as well as the jeweled stupa and all the innumerable bodies of Shakyamuni that then he emanates in all directions, right? Because they're embodied in the sutra, not only in the sense that the sutra is, by its own account, the whole body of the Buddha, but also in the sense that the vivid descriptions of these apparitions in the sutra does, in a really quite straightforward way, make all those manifestations of the Buddha present in the mind of those who listen. However long ago this or any Buddha may have passed into Parinirvana, he lives and continues to transform listeners whenever the, the sutra is performed with great eloquence, right? Um, so the Buddha's injunction to build a stupa wherever the sutra is performed or written has just been fulfilled, right? It's a stupa constructed of Buddha speech. Um, 
And um, this image uh, on this slide is a jeweled pagoda mandala um, from Japan. Um, it's comprised of the characters of the first two chapters of the Lotus Sutra. It is a stupa made of words, right? I don't know if you, you can't really see right in the, um, in the slide, um, each of the characters, but the characters are in order, the characters of the, su of the sutra itself, right? Um, so this is, you know, a very literal, a kind of a literalization, a materialization of, of what I'm saying, right? In, in an important sense, I think. Um, so the vow, the particular variety of Buddhist speech that makes that materialization manifest, right? This stupa of words um, is the vow. Um, it's a past prediction, you could say, right? A vow, a past vow, a vow is a prediction, uh, speaking about the uh, uh, speech act about the future, right? Um, indexed to the present moment both the present moment of narration and the present moment of performance. So um, the previous vow of many jewels, right? Prabhutaratna begins with a reflection on a still more distant past, but one that subtly references the present moment of both narration and performance. And I'll sort of show you how this works. Um, here's what he says. Previously, so long as I did not hear this Lotus Sutra, I did not enter into complete and perfect awakening. But after I heard this Lotus Sutra, I entered into complete and perfect awakening. Now, I mean, remember his body is interred in the Lotus Sutra, right? Um, uh, so this past experience presumably explains why as Shakyamuni Buddha tells those present, when Prabhutaratna was about to enter final Nirvana, he made the following proclamation. After I enter final nirvana, a single great jeweled stupa must be made for my bodily form. Wherever among all the worlds this Lotus Sutra should be performed, let this stupa containing my body come forth. When this Lotus Sutra is being performed by any other Buddhas, let my stupa float in the air above the assembly ground and let this stupa with my body offer words of praise to those Buddhas who are teaching this Lotus Sutra, which is of course what just happened, right? Um, in, in the beginning of the chapter. Um, so the temporal dynamics in this passage in the vow are particularly complex. Um, so within the frame of Prabhuta Ratna's own pronouncement of the vow, the passage moves between his reflection on his own past as a bodhisattva, um, that's a pre-Buddha, right? A Buddha to be, who only attained awakening after hearing the Lotus Sutra the pronouncement of the vow on the brink of his final nirvana and the vow's active production through prediction of the future, right? It's because he made the vow that the stupa appears in the future, in other words. But this frame is encased within another. Um, Shakyamuni's Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha's explanation of why this giant glittering stupa has suddenly appeared. Um, Shakyamuni too, reaches into the distant past when Prabhuta Ratna was Buddha to explain the predicted present manifestation of the stupa. Um, and by speaking Prabhuta Ratna's vow, himself predicts the future recurrence of this manifestation. But there's a third frame that encloses both of these, right? You know, kind of have stupas within stupas within stupas. Um, the time of performance in which an audience hears these stories of two past times and two past Buddhas from a performer who is present, right? Um, and who has in the immediately preceding chapter been unequivocally identified as a Buddha equivalent, right? So, it's in this predicted time that both Prabhuta Ratna and Shakyamuni become imaginatively manifest as their past words about the future are made present, right? Indeed, both of their whole bodies are inside the stupa of words that is the Lotus Sutra. Shakyamuni joins Prabhuta Ratna there whenever the sutra is performed. And so do the sutra's auditors, right? Past, present, and future meet and transform one another. In fact, the sutra actually has Shakyamuni get up into the stupa and, and join Prabhuta Ratna there, right? So that's why uh, there are all these wonderful images of um, the two of them sitting together. Um, it's a very clever kind of motif, right? To draw attention to the play of time in the moment of performance, past Buddha, present Buddha, 
of course, they're both passed to us now, right? Sitting together in the stupa, the reliquary. Um, so uh, the fertile interaction between prediction and postdiction continues in the subsequent section of the same chapter, right? In, in the Sanskrit version, I should say, um, where we find a past life story, right? A postdiction um, about Shakyamuni and his evil cousin, Devadatta, okay? Um, Shakyamuni describes how he sought the sutra through countless past lives, right? Once when he was a king, he gave up his throne, right? Vowing, um, may I become the servant of him who will bestow upon me the highest dharma, right? The Buddha's teaching and explain its meaning. Um, so there's a sage who teaches the Lotus Sutra that takes him up on this offer and over the course of a thousand years of servitude teaches him the sutra. The sage is Devadatta to be, right? The, the guy who's gonna become him. Um, uh, in case you don't know, um, Devadatta is the Buddha's evil cousin, right? He's, he's like the epitome of, of, of badness in, in lots of Buddhist stories, right? So um, Shakyamuni then announces that he owes his attainment of Buddhahood to his good friend Devadatta, and he predicts Devadatta's attainment of Buddhahood in calculable eons hence, right? Um, I mean, what makes Devadatta such a brilliant and shocking example of the power of the sutra is precisely that he's the quintessential Buddhist baddie, right? Um, he's destined for an eon in hell um, in some accounts, but because he taught his servant the Lotus Sutra in this past life, even Devadatta will become a Buddha, right? Presumably his bad behavior in his present life has slowed his progress down somewhat. He may still be going to hell first, right? Um, Uh, so, and then the, the revelation of his previously unknown, indeed unimaginable, right, past and future, transforms his character in the present moment. He's no longer the character that he appeared to be, right? We just thought he was like the evil cousin, bad guy, and now there's this backstory that we've just been given that changes everything. Um, in this respect, I think he's a, um, he's a good model for understanding how um, time is being um, manipulated in the sutra, right? Set in motion by the sutra, um, in which the present moment, right? And the present person is radically altered by post-diction and pre-diction, right? Um, just like Devadatta, same for us, right? Yeah, same for um, any audience. Um, the Lotus Sutra alters Devadatta's karma, you could say, right? such that he will become a Buddha despite his sins, not only because he taught the sutra in the past, but also, and perhaps more crucially, because the Lotus, by telling this story, literally changes his life. In other words, the narration is the event, right? Um, and if we assume that the Lotus taught by the sage in um, that previous life contained this same story, right? then he has known about this outcome for a very long time, right? Maybe he got reckless. <laughs> um, okay, let's uh, think a little bit more about um, what happens after this in the story. So the story of Devadatta changes things, not only for him, but also for listeners, both indirectly in that Devadatta's transformative encounter with the sutra reframes ours, right, our own, um, and directly, in that we are given an explicit story conditional prediction from the Buddha, right? Um, and this is the um, prediction uh, from the Buddha. Any noble son or daughter who in times yet to come will hear this sutra chapter of the Lotus of the Fine Dharma and having heard it will not doubt, not be uncertain and have a, having a clear mind will fervently concentrate on it. That person will avoid bad rebirths and be reborn in the presence of Buddhas, ceaselessly hearing this sutra. Okay. Um, the, um, the verb I'm translating as fervently concentrate, um, it's adimuch for the Sanskritists, um, is sometimes translated as believe or have faith, but as others have noted, that connotation is not generally supported by its usage in these texts. Um, the term suggests in, instead a kind of intense 
interested focusing of intention on an object so as to bring it into imaginative being, right? A determined concentration on the imaginative realization, the making real, right, of the sutra's words. So despite the rhetoric and the conditional prediction, right, will not doubt, will not be uncertain, Devadatta's unlikely ascendance, like so many other stories in the sutra, seems precisely calculated to generate doubt rather than faith, right? Devadatta, really? Yeah. Um, as the Buddha repeatedly insists, his skillful teachings in the sutra are difficult to understand. What the sutra asks of its listeners in exchange for a prediction is no easy task. But if the listener can imagine Devadatta into future Buddhahood, surely he can also imagine himself into happy rebirths. Um, the auditors of the Lotus need simply, I mean, it's not simple at all, but redraw, the, redraw their horizons of expectation for the future based on the experience of reading and being read by the Sutra. The Sutra presents the listener with a really formidable challenge. You take this like um, archetypally far-fetched story about Devadatta's past and future and make it so. Whether doing so changes the future in the manner predicted for Devadatta or the listener is impossible to say. And maybe that question kind of misses the point, right? What it certainly does transform is the space of experience and the horizon of expectation, which is to say the presence of both the past and the future. Language, story is the agent of transformation and time is the medium. Before we dismiss these manipulations as necessarily dependent on the mistaken belief of the listener, then we should consider more seriously the sheer linguistic, not magical or irrational force of predictions and postdictions alike for reframing the present and their significant similarities to, as well as differences from contemporary secular representations and manipulations of time, including the writing of history. Maybe it's worth pointing out the obvious. From the point of view of lived experience, oh, let me know. From the point of view of lived experience, the past and the future are works of the imagination. By definition, they are never present as material realities, right? Whether the stories we tell are based on present evidence, right? Traces of the past, seeds of the future, or on other stories like those in the Lotus Sutra, they remain stories and are made present only in our imaginations. And they are stories that in crucial ways are about the present. When we write histories, when we use evidence, present traces of time gone by, times gone by, to reconstruct stories of the past, stories that like those in the Lotus Sutra reconfigure the present space of experience and horizon of expectation. Um, as I noted earlier, whatever else they may do, histories of pre-modern times and places, that is post-dictions, right? Um, make modernity possible. Whatever else they may do, narrative, narratives of progress, predictions of a sort, right? Predictions that maybe like all predictions, reconfigure the present and the past as well as the future, make now better than then and fill the present with hope for the future. And in a strange way, the present is constituted by such predictions and postdictions, right? Most of our present experience is mediated by the narratives we weave or inherit or encounter suddenly in a text or performance, right? Narratives about the future and the past. Significant strands of Buddhist practice aim precisely to provoke an experience of the unmediated present. And perhaps the sutras share this aim when they draw attention to the present moment of performance as the moment of transformation. But they also transform the present itself by weaving new narratives about the past and the future. So language is the agent of transformation and time is the medium. If this is so, then history writing shares something crucial with the, the play of time in stories in the sutra. Take Prabhu Taratna in his jeweled stupa. 
materializing in the moment of performance, in fulfillment of a vow made in the distant past in anticipation of a future that is suddenly made present. The distant past is brought to life even as it remains curiously marked as dead, as past. Prabhuta Ratna's stupa enclosed body remains, remains, traces of a being no longer present, except in this text that is his whole body, which enables him to continue to act in the world. Is this, is this image not actually quite illuminating of the writing of history? A history does bring the past into to imaginative life in the present, and it enables it to act in the world, while it nonetheless remains a trace, a relic of a time no longer in existence. A history brings the past to life as past, but nonetheless grants it a form of present existence with potential vitality and agency. What would it mean to write history and read history with such a theory of textualized, textually revitalized time in mind? How might it change the story we tell or the mode of its telling? What if we recognize the power of language to transform the real more deeply than is usually done? And what if we were to read and write histories with an awareness of the transformative potential in the present materialization of the past? The task for such a writer of history is to locate moments in the space of experience that have the potential to rewrite our horizon of expectation, including alternative conceptions of time itself. And that's something that I've tried to do as well as say in my remarks today. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Natalie. That was just so rich. And um, so I wanted to just um, invite people to, um, you can raise your hand or put questions in the chat. If, if It's great if you can raise your hand and then, and then we can see you and call on you and you can ask your question directly of Natalie or offer your comment. And um, as you're doing that, as you're gathering your thoughts, I'd like to um, ask a couple questions. Well, first I think I have a comment is that listening um, to this, especially um, I think at this time, you know, there's a lot of anxiety here in the US in particular over just what stories are we telling about <laughs> our history and what does that mean for our future together or not together you know there's so much um and it really you know shows the power the power of um of of what of the the stories we tell about the past and um also about our horizon of expectation for the future and and my question was um you had talked about predictions making the future. And when you said that, that made me think, okay, we're, we're, they're not referencing, I mean, often, sometimes people even say like Buddhism is deterministic because you know, um, people are predicting this future, but when you were saying predictions are making the future, then we're, it's not a reference to an already foreordained reality. It's a speak act, a speak act, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Speech yeah. act, <laughs> which is helping, you know, bring about that future. And then I, and um, I think that's right. So that's one question. But then the second part of that is with post-diction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if there's also, I mean, you also said make the past. And I wanted to know if that's, entirely analogous to making the future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's if it's also, you know, not referencing something an already accomplished fact, but being, you know, is, is creating it. And so I'm just wondering if you notice in Mahayana Sutras, and also maybe perhaps in some of the other theory you've read, right. you know, is that completely analogous that the making uh, predictions making the future and post-diction making the past, or is there a different sense of the of the reality of the past versus the future? And I guess that also goes to, um, sorry, I didn't mean that to be so long, but also goes to a question about, you know, 
the kind of historical consciousness which is represented in these texts. Because you said, you know, there's definitely a sophisticated historical consciousness there, but I think I took you to, to mean it's not exactly the same as what, what modern thinkers have in mind when we say they lack a, a historical consciousness. So they have a different kind of historical consciousness, I guess, than modern. So yeah. um, sorry, that was a long question, but I think the parts were related. <laughs> Uh, they are really related. Um, and maybe that's where I would kind of, I'll try to maybe like put my finger on the place where I think they're all related and maybe I can spin back um, through them. So um, this is something I didn't get into for lack of time and it's kind of complex too, but when, you know, in theory, um, uh, people who, who theorize how speech acts work, right? It's not that that's all making or all describing, it's that by describing something, um, that um, does, does not exist exactly as it is described, you're making it into that thing, right? So the, the making and the describing are not, you can't take them apart. That's the thing, right? And so there's some, there, there's some kind of, um, uh, some buddhological consequences of this, okay? And then I think there are also some, some um, consequences for us thinking about our moment and the kind of um, frightening questions around um, the power of particular narratives. And, um, and, the, um, and I think the uh, unfortunate in some ways um, recourse to um, dividing the two, right? The making and the describing so that one becomes completely sort of false, made, make, made up and the other becomes completely true, not at all, nothing. And all language is performative, right? Um, and until we can kind of acknowledge that, right? The ways in which all language both describes and makes, right? Then um, I, I think that, that we're um, stuck with, stuck in, in sort of a binary that's not very helpful, right? Um, for either politically helpful or in any other way, right? Um, but uh, let me say, first of all, sort of buddhologically speaking, that um, this is one of the ambiguities about the, the Buddha's own um, uh, knowledge and speech, right? Um, on the one hand, he's omniscient, so he could just be described, or he's you know, said to be omniscient, so he could just be describing what happened in the past or, and what happened in the future. But um, he's also um, the master of efficacious strategies, right? Um, speech acts, I would say, primarily, not only speech, but other things too. Um, uh, but so I'm thinking about um, Upaya Kaushalya, right? Um, uh, efficacious strategies. Um, his um, speech uh, is geared not toward um, describing everything exactly as it is, but toward um, uh, saying the things that people need to hear in order to get to the right place, right? That's like a summary of it. But, but because it's his speech, when he says it, and this, the Lotus Sutra says this over and over again, right? When he says it, it's true because it's perfectly efficacious. When he says it, it becomes so, right? So there's this, it's, it's um, you know, it's an interesting and, and very different situation from any other person making speech acts because the Buddha's speech acts are perfect, right? By definition, they don't go wrong, right? Whereas the rest of us, our speech acts can fail. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, let me see. I'm trying to, I took some notes on your question. I want to see if I can kind of pull it together here. Um, is the, yeah, is the post-diction making the past analogous to the, to predictions making the future? Yes, with the qualification that there's always this ambiguity that I'm talking about between describing and making, right? Um, but it's the, it's like, that's the ambiguity that the whole, that I think the, the use of language in the sutras, especially around time turns on that ambiguity exactly, right? Is it making, is he making it? Is he describing it? Um, and I guess I, the Buddha, so it's like for the Buddha, these become collapsed. I mean, it, that yeah. is the place where the description and the making become totally one. <laughs> Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, totally. Um, I was thinking though, like predictions are the great example for thinking about how this works, right? The Buddha predicts someone to, Buddha, to, to Buddhahood. It could be that he's just seeing the future, right? That's the way that, but unless he makes the speech, speech act, the person is not going to get, is not going to, he, he has to make the act, right? He has to say it. So it's both making and describing, right? It's like right two together there. Um, yeah, um, but I feel like without, I don't know, I, I want to, I know other people have questions, so I'm going to um, uh, try to wrap this up, but I, I do think that our moment, it's it frightening to me sometimes thinking about doing this kind of work in a moment where so much seems to be hanging on the question of, of, of um, protecting truth, right? Um, <laughs> one of uh, um, somebody who, who read my paper at an earlier stage was sort of like, um, uh, you know, this is, you know, this is not, we do not want to, to sort of uh, condone people making reality, right, <laughs> kind of thing. But I feel like that's already happened. Like that ship has sailed, <laughs> not just, and yeah, I mean, it has sailed like, you know, not just in our moment, but in so many ways. And if we don't sort of um, start to sort of learn how to deal with narratives in their kind of um, performative complexity, right? Um, then, then the sort of like calls to truth are, are sort of happening in a sort of empty space that, is not that is not going to have much resonance. Um, anyway, uh, I could say a lot more about that, but um, yes. Okay. Well, some of the other questions might might yeah. touch on this. So um, I see. Um, okay, I see one person wrote question, and so if that. Um, oh, oh, hey, Doug, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll just go in the order that they are here and um Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, sorry. We'll just go in yeah. the order that they are here and um, um I hear me echoing. <laughs> yeah. Just tell me what to where I where I should go. Um should I just start with this uh is there a way to know from the sutras under discussion what calendar was being used in them in the time period or these sutras were created? How does modern scholarship know when the Lotus Sutra is created? Um, okay, so uh, that's, uh, okay. Um, we, uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware, I should say, uh, because of the focus of my own scholarship, right? Of um, whether, what, what kind of calendar would have been used in um, ancient South Asia at the time, if, if, if that's even known. I'm not sure, okay. Um, uh, but in terms of how modern scholarship knows when the Lotus Sutra was created, um, there's a, a Latin phrase, right? Terminus antiquem, right? That's like the, it says like, it had to have been before this time, <laughs> okay? And the, that, that time is um, determined by the earliest translations of, um, of the sutra into Chinese. Right. It had to obviously had to have been in existence before it could be translated. Um, and so with the, um, with the Lotus Sutra, that means that it was probably in existence in the first century of the Common Era, right? Ish. Um, so should I move on to the next? Um... Yeah, so Rebecca, did you wanna ask your question or you just want us to read it? You can read it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I'm moved by how empowering, I'm gonna read it because of the, maybe people listening later won't see the chat. So I'm moved by how empowering and present your speech acts here make speaking. How do you feel time in the sutras and their extension can aid us in how to tell make stories for the injustices in our world that sometimes Buddhist language attempts to spiritually bypass? Um, gender, race, age, other social inequities? Oh yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and, and that's actually a wonderful insight too, because I sometimes struggle with, um, you know, there's, uh, if <laughs> some of my other work has gone into the ways in which um, the Lotus Sutra is, is very sort of um, strongly patriarchal in its um, kind of conception. 
Um, and, uh, and so the, there's, a, um, there's a way in which I, I really do not want to um, dismiss texts like this on that basis. But you, you're pointing, Rebecca, to the, the ways in which um, we need to kind of identify um, techniques or strategies or, or um, ways of telling stories, um, uh, ways of, um, of empowering, right? That we can learn from the sutras regardless of their, um, uh, for instance, gender politics, among other things, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so how, how can time do that? I mean, maybe there are ways in which, I was thinking about this actually as I was um, uh, reading the, the last couple slides or so, um, that uh, there are people doing amazing things with um, history now, right? Um, uh, looking back, um, for instance, into um, the history of enslavement, in the US and telling, telling stories that have not been told before. And those stories matter so much, right? Um, I wonder if, if there's just, there's ways of thinking about um, uh, time that come from the sutra that, that might even sort of add some robustness to that project, right? Or, or lead in some creative directions, um, Right, that that might not otherwise be opened up. So I mean, it, it feels like a, a useful conversation partner for those kinds of projects. Um, yeah, I'd need to think more about. I, I want to think more about um, about the the power of the the kinds of the vision of language and of time and their interconnection and how it might kind of feed into other projects, social justice projects now. Yeah, really great questions. Thank you. Yeah, so there was a couple, so I just want to do the order. So um, uh, Stuart Lay has had um, their hand up for a while and then Doug had messaged me. So I think I'll put Doug in the queue after, right after that. And then there's Tess and Elaine, and then there's two from the chat. So I think I'll put Doug in the queue after, right after that. Oh, Dr. Kumar, uh, really. Glad to be here and uh, thank you for your lecture. And I'm a graduate student from University of Arizona. Um, so I have a question of the concept of the rebirth. Mm -hmm. um, so you also mentioned in your lecture that telling uh, the, the text of Stuba and the rebirth of Buddha. And I think the rebirth is a really important concept to define the transformation, right? And actually the rebirth could be in million years or in tomorrow mm -hmm. or the next second. So it could be really fast yeah. because the present moment is very, very short. Um, so I think that's 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 about time. But uh, when, when you addressed about time and how long that time could be. And when we, when we read the sutras, when we read the text, uh, when we read, we will rebirth in the pure land. We don't know when, and we don't know uh, will be in the next second or will be the next year. We don't know about our lives. So I think that message is powerful because we don't know the future uh, as a human being. But also it, it seems if the rebirth is just next second, it, it, it sounds like we can do something. I can do something for the next second. I can grab a drink right, to hydrogen. Or I can I can I can ask the questions like right now. So I think it's really to deal with the scope of the time you're talking about whether that was one moment or will be something imagining uh, unknown. And and that sometimes got me frustrated uh, when reading the text uh, because on one hand it's really powerful, but on another hand it kind of telling me. Uh, I still need to deal with the, you know, the sufferings or the negativities in life because I know I'm going to live the next second, so that will be my next rebirth. Yeah, so I, I actually very, very much follow with the the previous questions about injustice, and so but 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 now I just relate uh, probably that question and also uh, to the concept of rebirth and also the time 
the scope of time that uh, uh, if you could respond to it a little bit. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That's, um, that's really insightful. And uh, I think actually you already put your finger on it, right? I mean, in, I was drawing attention um, throughout the presentation to this almost paradox, right? Where um, this, these, these um, pre and post dictions that refer to the very distant past and the very distant future are always actually transforming the present moment, right? So what's the moment of rebirth? It's, it's both, right? Um, that it's the transformation of the present in, a sense, in some sense is also a kind of rebirth, right? And so it's by manipulating um, our stories about the distant past and distant future that the present moment um, can be transformed. And, and that, as you say, is, rebirth, is a rebirth of, um, of the next second, right? Right there. Um, so I think that the sutras are, are um, thinking with you about these different time scales <laughs> in a certain way, right? Um, yeah, that's, um, yeah, very nice um, observations about that. Thank you so much for a great question. Hello. Okay, hopefully that's all working. Can you unmute yourself, Doug, to ask? Ah, you just got muted again when you started talking. So I'm not sure what's happening there. <laughs> <laughs> Try talking now. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're muted. So, yeah, you're muted. So, how about now? Can you hear me now? I'll just yes. turn off my video. Yes. Okay, good. Yes, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I've been having internet problems, but I really enjoyed your talk. And um, my question relates somewhat to Karen's um, about predictions and mm -hmm. um, and about like causality. So I can see like the Buddha's you know predictions or prophecies, his Vyakaranas would be would come to fruition. But, you know, Deva Dutta's, it doesn't seem like, you know, uh, I mean, I like the idea of an aspiration or like adimuch, right? This kind of intense, you know, where you focus your mind, you bring that into being. I like that. And I like the, the pranidhana of, of kind of an aspiration or a fervent wish. So my, my question is that why is the term vow used for pranidhana? Because it mm. seems like a vow is something that can be broken. Um, and I'm wondering if this, you know, this is, sorry, it's kind of a selfish question because I'm working on a project now on this notion, but I feel like it's coming in from East Asia. Um, it's mm -hmm. kind of getting this term, you know, it's getting read as vow. Um, but I'm just curious if you could say more about like David Dutta in particular in this pranidhana um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. Can you, um, Doug, can you say a bit more about uh, what what about the Deva Data question, the episode in particular? Um, well, like I could vow, I mean, I could pranidhana, I could wish never to become an astronaut, right? But I'm not a Buddha. And so, and maybe some point in the future, like I'll have an opportunity and it'll be like a really good thing for me to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so if that, uh, you know, I'm just wondering about the causal process for like an unenlightened being, a sentient being, would make some wish or aspiration. And why is it that, why would it come true? I mean, I guess if you take the vow language and, and that the vows must be fulfilled or particularly like Bodhisattva vows, you know, they will be fulfilled. Uh, but I'm just wondering like David Dutta, you know, unless he's kind of a disguised Buddha, um, you know, why would his pranidhana, you know, come to be the servant of, of the preacher of the Dharma come? come true. I guess that's one part of the question. The other is why, why pranidhana, why do you translate that as vow? Yeah, um, 
Honestly, uh, in terms of why translated as vow, I think that's a great question. I really, um, I struggle a lot with how to translate some of these terms. Uh, there aren't good translations. I've just sort of excised preaching completely from my vocabulary, um, but I used it for years before because it felt like the only option, right? Um, but, you know, we find new options as we read the text and develop them further. Um, I, um, in terms of, of um, vows um, or pranidhanas, <laughs> maybe I want to say, right? Um, uh, the, um, I've, I keep coming back to, to the kind of um, paradigmatic moment in um, the story of Sumedha. This is the first time the pre-Buddha um, gets a prediction to Buddhahood, Buddhahood right? Um, and there's, there's like, he makes the vow, right? The, or the resolve. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that it's um, pranidana, the term in that case, but in any case, it's, it's another um, technical Buddhist term for, for a kind of resolve or vow. But unless he um, also gets the confirmation, the prediction from the Buddha, it, it will not come to fruition, right? It's necessary that both things happen. Um, and I wonder if there isn't something similar um, going on uh, in, in some of these stories where um, the vow receives its confirmation. Um, even, I mean, with the with the Prabhuta Ratna, I think there's, there's this really interesting way in which the emergence of the, um, the stoop stupa in you know in the context of any narration is the confirmation that the vow succeeded right so it's like built into the it's actually built into the the um the text itself the the confirmation right um in the case of uh devadatta it was actually the pre-buddha who made the the pranidhana right um the um he uh it was the, the Bodhisattva who, um, who said, I want to become the um, servant of anybody who can teach me the highest Dharma, right? I vow to become the servant of anyone who can teach me the highest Dharma. And he becomes Devadatta's servant for a thousand years. Um, so Devadatta didn't have to make a vow apparently, at least we don't hear that part of the story if he did, right? Um, he, uh, he uh, um, all he had to do was teach the Lotus Sutra. That was enough, yeah. Um, okay, where should I go next? Okay, yeah, so um, Tess, and then we'll do some questions and then there's Elaine, and then we'll do some questions from the chat. Okay. Thank you, teacher. Um, I am uh, kind of interested in how we understand things and in our, for our time are imposing things upon things like time. Mm -hmm. A moment is 1 64th of a second. We decided that we figured it out. There's a gap. We have stopped time in very well controlled and constructed conditions, but yea, verily, but what is a stupa, okay? So as I think about this, and I think about time as like, you look at a stupa or anything, it looks so solid. It's not flowing. Yes, it's flowing. It's where it's, everything's flowing. Yeah. So why do we assign our bravest knight to guard the dragon? I don't know. Does anybody? Because of the appearance at the time when the dragon and the knight and the stupa were there. Um, so listening to the discussion of um, the elements that must be present and actually um, the events of time as a prediction, and I'm probably gonna get this wrong, but like a post-diction. Mm -hmm. um, and we have done so much with time. It was two, three years ago, we found out through by happenstance, somebody pointed their telescope and saw two massive black holes about to like collapse into each other. Um, and when that happened, 
we found out there were gravity waves that all heavy metals occurred in space, not on planet, all that came out of there. That in fact, we could go faster than the speed of time. Oh, and what happened was there was a big explosion and the energy caught the matter on the front end. And so as we watched this, like uh, I think four, there was a four month lag in light, we it looked to us like it was slow. That object that the, the pushing the matter in front from that energy of that explosion was too slow. Couldn't go faster than the speed of time. Stephen Hawking died. And then like two months later, all that matter busted away from that energy and it exceeded the speed of light. So we put ourselves in conundrums. We lock ourselves in. And the Buddhas have been telling us that for a long time. When you think about the yogis and meditators and what they have done and what we have seen them do, you know, uh, too numerous to mention. When you kind of bring all these things in together, um, I think there's something there. I am fascinated by the idea of all, all has consciousness. All the intersecting universes, whatever's in them, has consciousness. Um, now comes a question of we don't even understand how consciousness takes place in our brains. There's no centralized areas. There are discrete areas where we'll see things light up when people are put under anesthetic, but there's no connection we can find. I, my background's neurobehavioral side because of bachelor's. Um, and I'm looking for my advanced degree place. Um, and I'm kind of interested in if uh, Beloit, if some people might not also be interested in treating giving a treatment yeah. so to these stories. Yeah, um, maybe um, could sort of summarize um, out of there because I think you brought up lots of interesting questions, but we only have about 12 minutes left. Entanglement, interdependence, independent arising, okay? Excellent. And it's, and so <laughs> I'm, and, but we're now chasing the dragon <laughs> as consciousness, you know? Mm -hmm. How does, how, yeah, I'm very, very, very super interested in it. And this sounds like it might be the, a place where there's a crossroads, an intersection, a confluence that could occur within academia to look at that. I sincerely think we can bust some things open um, to allow new ideas to enter. We can cross space. I mean, you know, having watched those black holes, you know, oh, the energy from them, oh, go faster than the speed of light. We can do some things and it's going to take interdisciplinary stuff. Um, so I am, I'm, so, I'm so curious yeah. about who's thinking about these things. Yeah, what, what kind of interdisciplinary connections do you see um, with what you're looking at in relationship to other philosophical thoughts about time and um, um, consciousness, as well as within the Buddhist context, how does all of this relate to dependent origination? Um, maybe that's one one thread of those, you know, really interesting topics you brought up, Tess. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I, there was so much there to ask. Thank you. Um, but I, one of the things I would say is that it seems to me that the um, the sutras that I work on are really trying to um, provoke an awareness of the ways that we um, that are um, uh, consciousness, if you want to use that term, right, um, is. Um, uh, is shaped by the stories, the narratives that we weave, right? In some ways, the sutras are kind of, um, uh, on the one hand, a kind of um, intervention with new narratives and, and sort of really sort of trying to shake up the, um, the assumptions that we have about ourselves and our, the world that we live in and what's real and what's not and all of that, right? They're trying to do that thing. Um, and on the other hand, I think they're trying to draw our attention to the very fact that we're constantly weaving narratives about 
um, ourselves and the world. And, and so that it's on the one hand, it's doing the thing that it's trying to say, see, look how this works kind of thing. Um, that's, I mean, that's what I think is going on with the sutras. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, is Elaine next? Is that right? Yeah. So Elaine and then, and then I'll, there's a couple, couple in the chat. So we'll do those okay. next. All right. Hi, Professor Dummer. Um, I'm a PhD student in Buddhist studies at Stanford right now. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm obsessed with time and narrative in um, Dzogchen and tantric literature and also in film and fiction. So this is like such, so wonderful to hear you um, speak. I have two questions, so feel free to answer any part of them. Um, but I wanted to return to the image of the golden pagoda that you showed us that was literally rendered through the text of two chapters of the Lotus Sutra. I really love that image. And I was wondering if you could help me think through how the speech act is functioning in the image of the pagoda. Um, does there need to be a level of comprehension of the words um, being seen in this case, or even sometimes being heard or said for these speech acts to be efficacious? And then kind of connected to this, um, my second question was just, I wanted uh, maybe a little more uh, help with thinking through what catalyzes exactly the transformative process for the reader or the listener or the viewer, um, because you talked about how prediction and postdiction manage the horizon of expectation. But um, one thing that I'm working with and grappling with is, you know, what, if any, is the role of affect in this transformation? Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Ooh, <laughs> so many good things. Um, so with the um, the the sort of um, uh, the pagoda sutra, right from from Japan. Um, so uh, I think actually the best thing I could do is to refer you to um, the wonderful work of um, one of our colleagues, um, Hallie O'Neill, um, who has a fantastic book and a, an earlier article too. Um, on the jeweled pagoda mandalas, um, and there, and really about performativity in the um, in the creation of the the um, image itself, right? And really thinking about exactly the kinds of questions that you're talking about. Um, so the book, the um, the 2018 book, is called Word Embodied. Um, uh, so yeah, that would be my recommendation on that. She will just do a better job than I will of, tell, of answering your question, um, uh, uh, which I think is an excellent one. Um, so uh, what catalyzes, so you're, you're thinking about affect in, in your own work. Yeah, so I feel like um, there, there's something about the way that the, um, I've, I've talked about this before as a kind of presencing effect that the language of the, the sutra has when, when it's performed and, it's, and, and the thing that's being performed is exactly cued to the moment that you're experiencing, that that is like a, a, a moment that's you know, rich with affect or potential affect anyway. And the sutra is extremely aware of the role of affect, right? It's constantly saying, it's not that you, you need to sort of know or understand or, um, believe usually, right? A lot of times it's like, you know, if you feel joy when you hear this, then you receive a prediction to Buddhahood. It's like, it's about, it's about the kind of, a kind of emotive resonance, right? Um, more than anything else, I think, um, in terms of the way that it, so there's almost like, so this is something I've been thinking about. Um, I, I think it's quite exciting that the, the sutras are, um, they have a notion of normative affect, which you'd almost think is like not possible in the way that we think about the, the sort of affect as something sort of, um, you know, uncontrolled that we, we just sort of spontaneously would feel. But there's definitely something going on in these texts that's about cultivating affective um, states, right? Um, you know, priming yourself for that kind of thing. So I am, um, and, and so what catalyzes the experience, I, I feel like in part, what you're trying to do, um, you want to be immersing yourself ever more deeply in the sutra in terms of memorizing it, right? Making it part of your own body, all of that kind of thing. And, and that, that is like all these practices that are explicitly called for in the sutra are building your um, sensitivity, your capacity. I mean, what we would, 
um, call in um, uh, in Sanskrit terms um, to be a, a sakhridaya, sakhridaya, right? Um, uh, somebody who um, is sort of their their heart resonates with the with the text, something like that, right? That there's there's a kind of um, way that the the sutra is trying to train people in that kind of affect. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's what I would. Um, that would I, that's what I would suggest. It sounds like you're doing really interesting stuff, and I think you were the person who suggested the the panel on time next year too, right? I would love to have you. Um, I mean, this, this yeah. is like so exciting. This is the oh. most excited I've been in a while hearing your talk. So um, yeah. thank you so much for those responses. Oh. I'm so glad people are interested in this topic. I think it's an excellent one. All right, thank you. Great, sounds like a great panel. So mm -hmm. I see that Jacqueline has her hand up and I'm hoping, Natalie, I don't know how your time is, but if you, we can go over just a little because there's also oh, yes. two questions in the chat and I don't want them to, you know, I want, they've been in there for a while. So Orushi asks, uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. From the sutras, is there a way to derive a Buddhist theory of poetic strategies for description that aid the process of transforming the listener? Thank you. Um, so I, I'm not 100% sure I understand the second part of the question, but the first part I can say, yes. In fact, um, this is a project that I'm very much engaged in right now. Um, and um, I have a piece coming out in History of Religions. There's a special issue on Mahayana Sutras coming out very soon. And mine is on um, sovereign ritual and the poetics of power in Mahayana Sutras. And I'm really trying to derive a kind of speech act theory, but it's a speech act theory that's about ritual poetic, about the sutras as ritual poetic speech acts um, and, and trying to kind of derive a theory from that. So yes, I think so. Um, it's, you know, uh, a, a special variety of poetics, I guess I would say, right? Um, uh, but yes, I, I think that's, that's a very exciting um, area right now. Um, Strategies for description that aid the process of transformation of the listener. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand what you're getting at there, but um, um, okay. So, uh, yeah. And so this next one from Jason, um, you mentioned imagination of the f as the focus of reality compared to modern secular focus on physicality, or I think you used the term materiality. Mm -hmm. How much, if any, of the miraculous actions of a Buddha like flying would have been understood as external to the imagination and how much would have been understood as visionary is the flying, in quotes, um, et cetera, just seen in the individual mind, or would it have been seen as a collective experience seen by multiple people? Those are great questions to which I think there are no answers. <laughs> Thank you, Jason, for asking them. I mean, I just, what I mean by that is like the, the sutras don't give us that level of specificity, right? Um, so, uh, so I think they're really fascinating questions to ask, and I think you know you're really getting at some some of the other um, assumptions that we tend to bring to texts as people who are sort of um, brought up to think about individuals as being separate, and and you're kind of calling all that into question in interesting ways. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure how to answer those from the perspective of the sutra, though. Um, I think the kind of the imagination, visionary experience piece is where I would feel most comfortable um, saying that, that I think the sutras just start to make sense in a whole new way as, start, as soon as you start to think about them doing that kind of work, right? And to me, that, that makes a really strong argument for the fact that that's the kind of work they're trying to make, do, right? Yeah. Seems to me there's lots of things in the Buddhist world where, where even Buddhists won't make a strong distinction between things that we would think of as, as happening in the imagination or in, in the realm of psychology and that are happening externally. They'll often hold both. I mean, I'm just thinking of things like, you know, the different um, realms of existence and different kind of beings. These are both things that are happening internally and extra and it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's it's problematic because it's a binary way of phrasing the question anyway, but just thinking ethnographically, 
you know, when you talk to some Buddhists, they will describe these physical things that happen, um, manifestations of images of deities in the earth or, um, you know, the um, slow decay of a body. Um, and those to me still feel distinct from just simple visualizations of a deity. Um, even though like both are an experience that are happening within the imagination and the imagination is still outside of the body as well. Wait a minute, is it? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm thinking like, I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking about just let me, this is a small kind of example, but I think it's pertinent to the sutras, which are so much about their own performance, right? Um, when you see a powerful for powerful performance of, of a play or an opera or music or something like that, your body reacts in, in really concrete ways to what is, you know, at least partially a kind of um, emotional, affective, Im imaginative experience, right? Your body is all part of that. I mean, it's not not separate from it. But anyway, I'm probably getting into to areas that um, you're really not talking about, Jason. I think that those were really good points. I just added and placebo, nocebo kind of. Um, <laughs> but let, let, let's go yeah. on. Um, Jack, uh, Jacqueline has um, had her hand up for a while. Yeah. So if you're still here, Jacqueline. Yeah, I'm still here. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you for a wonderful talk. It was really stimulating. And, and I just had a, um, uh, a couple of um, reflections. I, I know we're over time, so I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I was very interested, especially, uh, I, I work on the uh, historical reception of the Lotus Sutra, especially in East Asia. And uh, I, I was very struck by the fact that the, the gold stupa um, image written in text um, mm -hmm comes about at a period when there's this doctrine of original enlightenment that comes to the fore. And there's a, there's a strong claim that Buddhahood is not this distant goal to be achieved in the future, but is, is the original status of all beings. And, and we, we simply have to realize it. And so this image of the two Buddhas seated, seated by, seated side by side becomes interpreted mandalically. You, get, you see that in a lot of mandalas. And there's this claim that, um, the assembly at Vulture Peak is uh, still awesomely present and has not yet dispersed. So that becomes a sort of a metaphor for realizing this original enlightenment that, that we all possess. Um, but I, I um, also wanted to reflect on that sort of timeless enlightenment is intersecting with the present moment. And the sutra is very much addressing itself to uh, people who are hearing it in a future time that is in a sense assumed to be an evil time because it is long after the Buddha's passing. And I thought that your, your uh, discussion of post-diction and prediction really uh, helps make sense of the preceding chapter, which uh, I know you don't care for this translation, but is often translated as the Dharma preacher chapter, right, right, right. the person who teaches uh, the Lotus Sutra, where the Buddha says, first of all, um, if there is anybody you know, living in an evil age who is able to teach a single word of the sutra to somebody else, know that that person is a great bodhisattva who has served countless Buddhas and has voluntarily given up the merit uh, that would ordinarily accrue to their past unfathomable good deeds and has voluntarily chosen to be born in this miserable situation to save other beings. And upon such a person who's able to preach a single phrase of this sutra, I confer this prediction of supreme enlightenment. Uh, so it, that's both a post-diction and a prediction. And it seems to me that this would immediately, you know, if taken seriously, has the power to transform a person experiencing suffering because it, it sort of elevates them immediately to the status of a, a great bodhisattva who is here with this, this mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certain to achieve supreme enlightenment. Yeah, that's fantastic. And um, uh, oh, you're really making me think, you know, I, I hadn't um, I hadn't been thinking about this in terms of original enlightenment, which I know you've done so much work on. I really need to kind of put that together. Um, and what you're saying about the kind of the way the text, the text actually um, uh, transforms people in the moment of listening in a certain sense, right? If in, in, in the way that the narrative works, um, into um, someone who is already extremely advanced on the path, right? 
Um, it uh, just like the the prediction of the the Dharma Bonica that you're talking about, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's like um, in the moment of of hearing or speaking, I guess the Dharma Bonica is actually speaking that thing about him 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 or herself, or it's usually himself. Let's That's one place where I think, if, if I recall correctly, I think it might actually be him or her. Oh, good. <laughs> um, one of those few places. Yeah, there are a few. Um, uh, yeah, so the, 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 there's just even in the moment of saying it, that transformation happens because it's, it's about the person who's either speaking or hearing um, what's being said, right? It's, uh, so that um, maybe in some ways that, I don't know, I'm not sure that that connects to, um, to the question of, uh, the interpretation of the text in terms of an original enlightenment or not? Oh, maybe not. No, it's more of a separate. No, separate no I mean, no, I'm trying to, I was just trying to think through whether it did. I was kind of hoping. Well, it's, it's, uh, I mean, there's a, of course a, a whole ex exegetical effort to interpret every past and future reference in the Lotus Sutra in terms of the present. Yeah. So you get, you get this idea that, that it's happening now. You are present at that assembly. And, uh, so, and the bodily reading, I love the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, sort of the notion of the bodily reading of the Lotus Sutra where everything is, in it is, is actually sort of t describing important aspects of yourself and your own life and world that you may not know fully, um, which is, you know, really that, that resonates pretty strongly with the kind of reading that I was doing, I guess, but yeah, yeah, fantastic. Anyway, thank, thank you, so it's a great talk. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for those comments, I'm gonna, um, um, definitely looking more to the original enlightenment piece. Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Natalie. Thank you everyone for attending. And um, and this will be, if you wanna go back, I know like I, went, I was trying to take notes and diagrams <laughs> of the like, you know, logical moves with respect to time. So you can see the recording later. So I um, hope to see you back for um, Martin Adams' talk on um, the 16th and just a big Zoom um, thank you <laughs> to clap your, with your virtual hand or <laughs> raise your hand or whatever um, to thank Natalie for her wonderful talk this evening. And there's also, a, um, I'll save the chat because there's a few more things so if you might want to look at later, Natalie. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you everybody for coming. It's been great chatting with you all at the at the end of everything here great all right good night